Thank you very much, and thank you, ODI, for hosting us. Um, we're extremely pleased to be here and in your <coughs> lovely new premises. Um, well, the research uh, that we conducted covered three regions of the world, um, West Africa, parts of Latin America, and Southeast Asia, and eight countries in depth, and uh, uh, m many other countries in passing, so to speak. And the two books I'm presenting are first uh, the Horizontal Inequalities and Conflict Understanding Group Violence in Multi-Ethnic Societies, and that provides really an overview of our main hypotheses. What is the meaning of horizontal inequalities? What is the evidence that horizontal inequalities cause conflict? And it suggests some policy conclusions. The second book I'm presenting is edited by Ivan Gishawa, who is unfortunately not able to be here. And his is, in a, in a way, if you can think about the first book as a macro book about the overall fundamental causes of conflict, his is a much more micro book about what makes particular people um, join, join a conflict and actually fight. Because, of course, in any conflict, not everyone fights, only a minority do. <laughs> Why do they do it? And that is an interesting issue which is sort of parallel to what are the overall causes of the fighting actually happening. So they're very complementary. Um, now let me first start with the first book, and I'm going to do these two books in ten minutes, so it's a bit of a sketchy overview. Horizontal inequalities are inequalities among groups of people with a common identity, which could be an ethnic identity, a religious identity, racial, regional, even class, anything <coughs> which makes them identify strongly with others in, in, in the same group. And of course there's gender. Um, it differs. It's called horizontal inequality to differentiate it from vertical, which is the normal inequality we talk about, inequality among individuals. And these inequalities are multidimensional. They include socioeconomic aspects like incomes and land and employment, political aspects, political power, and cultural aspects, the recognition of a group's culture. Now, we do emphasize that although we talk about groups, we recognize that they're socially constructed and that although they may be very meaningful to members at any one time, they can also change over time in response to all sorts of external influences. Uh, but at that point in time, the identities present a very powerful way of mobilizing people. It's very easy to mobilize people among, around a common identity and particularly against some other common identity as we know only too well by the many conflicts of this sort that happen. Now, the major findings of our research, having just set up, the hypothesis was that if you have sharp horizontal inequalities, conflict is more likely to happen. And uh, what we found was, first of all, that looking at cross-country evidence, econometric, looking at within-country evidence, also econometric, and also looking at case studies, we and others who've also looked at this issue found strong evidence that as socioeconomic inequalities rise, there is more conflict. So this is a real issue, it's a real problem. Um, when I first started this hypothesis, I found in a number of case studies that conflict countries were ridden with horizontal inequalities, but I didn't know if that was, every society is ridden with them in a way, so I didn't know if that was a differentiating characteristic or not, but this research enabled us to see that it was. Secondly, we found that where political and socioeconomic inequalities go in the same direction, so that the group which is politically excluded is also economically excluded, then conflict is more likely. But if one group is politically included, but even though it's poorer than the others, then conflict's less likely. And thirdly, we found that perceptions matter. Of course they do. It's how people perceive things. It's not how they are out there. <coughs> so. If people manipulate perceptions in a particular way, they can make a particular situation worse or better. Well, it follows from this a lot of strong policy implications. Oh, perhaps I've, that was the evidence. Oh. Um, first of all, that where the horizontal inequalities are large, you should address them. And that applies not just to countries in conflict, but also to countries just in the normal process of development. And we identify a range of policies, and Arnim's going to say more about the policies. Um, then we found that we looked at international policy, and international policy generally in the form of the World Bank and IMF and so on does not 
do anything very much about these inequalities. They don't do much about any sort of inequality, but they certainly don't do much about these inequalities. On the other hand, we found that many national societies do because they have to live with them. So that everything we learned about policy, we found in real policies in real time in particular countries. And finally, we concluded that it's very important to monitor these because if you don't know what's happening, then you don't know what's going to happen and uh, things can be very dangerous. So that, in a very brief moment, is the first book. The second book is trying to explore why some people fight and why others don't. And what we found is that the reason varies across conflict. So there's not a simple answer. Um, we often hear about people being coerced into armies, particularly children, but that was not the general finding. The general finding was that people do go in voluntarily. We often hear that greed is the reason people go in, they want <coughs> income and so on. That was not the general finding. Very often they go in because they want security, and these uh, militias offer, offer security. Young men and young women want agency, a feeling of control over their lives, and they feel that they get more of that, or so they say, when they go into conflict than when they don't. Women in particular, in Latin America studies, show we're trying to escape from very patriarchal domestic situations uh, and found that they got more independence. And there's this nice quote, the day I got my uniform, I understood that no one can now harm me, a feeling of women's emancipation. And in general, many younger people go in in order to confront the sort of marginalization they f face. But in every case, um, leaders are very important as to whether people fight or not. And I think that this goes back into the earlier study because the earlier study showed the importance of political inequalities. And political inequalities speak to leaders. If, if leaders are excluded politically, then they may mobilize people. Uh, and leaders were always important. Um, we found that there were huge contextual variations in why people fought, in, uh, uh, what the motives were. Latin American groups were more ideological and they had much stricter um, uh, discipline and more regular training and the African groups seemed to be more opportunistic. Um, religious groups were generally more disciplined than ethnic groups um, and we again emphasized the need to explore leaders' motivation as well as followers. Um, finally, what were the policy implications? Well, from this study, it was more difficult to come to general policy implications because the findings varied so much according to context. Um, but there was the general finding of reducing the marginalization of youth, not only through employment, which is how people normally see it, but also more generally through improving security in their position in society and improving the position of women. Um, and that the, uh, the, the, the normal post-conflict programs tend to focus too much on leaders and not enough on, the, on their followers. Um, all the policy implications are quite consistent with the findings of the first volume, so they go, they're very complementary. Um, but in general, I think the, the micro aspects are probably more complicated to tackle than the macro. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Francis.